wouldn't you fight for me? I would have fought for you. Tell me why didn't you feel my pain? My tears became the rain falling over my homelands. My homelands. So Defending my life story to you all My soul runs on empty Thirsting for something beautiful Oh, I am wanting When I love into my knee To recognize my Instead, I just disappeared. Tell me why did you never take me? Why didn't you fight for me? Oh, I would have fought for you. Tell me why didn't you? Hello, dear friends and relatives. Oh, it's, a, it's a beautiful day to be gathered. We're watching as uh, many of our relatives are joining us from across the country. Um, it's, it's, it's good to be here. I'm joined here with our NAB staff and all of our special guests. Um, again, my name is uh, Sitsai Altsa, Deborah Parker. I'm your host today um, as the National Indian Boarding School Healing Coalition's Chief Executive Officer. It has been an honor to do this work in love and loving respect of our ancestors and the next seven generations to come. We know this work cannot be done without your prayer, strength, love, and understanding. So we raise our hands to you. Tiguitzid. Thank you for joining us with your time and good energy during this time of truth telling. So welcome to NAB's seven weeks of action for seven generations. We are launching seven weeks of action. So you may all join us in advocating for HR 5444 and Senate Bill 2907. We appreciate each and every one of you for joining us today. We are excited to get this event started in a good way so we will begin with our opening prayer song by Robert MacArthur, also known as J.R. J.R. is a Nakota musician from White Bear First Nations. J.R. is preserving his language through song. He has been composing songs in his language for over 25 years and in 2021 produced a lullaby CD called This Child is a Gift. J.R. teaches language from our little ones to our elders. He has been instrumental in bringing back his language and a true gift to us. The floor is yours, JR. Good afternoon. Um, first, I want to uh, say it's an um, honor to be asked to do this for you. Uh, the work that you're about to, I guess, embark on. I really do truly wish you well and good fortune in um, what you're about to do. Uh, I am a residential school survivor. Uh, I still remember my first day. My mother's a residential school survivor and my father's a residential school survivor. So was my grandfather. And so we know those experiences that you're about to listen to. 
I, I was very fortunate um, growing up to have relatives of mine um, have the patience to teach and to share and to keep something alive. So uh, when Teresa had asked me to do this, I didn't realize this was going to be this big. I thought it was just for her little group. So I get really nervous and I, I'm around a big crowd. Um, so uh, if you'll bear with me, I, I had explained to Teresa earlier that the song is about four and a half minutes, but I'll sing it about two and a half minutes for you. And, and it's it, it's titled from uh, um, some of my work that I, I recently completed. I said, uh, Lullaby CD of This Child is a Gift. And that's the song I, I'd like to share with you today. We yo 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 JR, thank you for that beautiful prayer song to get us started in a good way. I just invite um, each and every one of you as we go through this uh, this afternoon together to remember to take a deep breath. And if you need water, if you need anything to take care of your spirit, please take care, take that time. Um, I lit some smudge here, so I'm sending you virtual smudge. And uh, you know, it's during these uh these sacred days and times of often sickness, we know it's tough to be together, but it's it's good that we're here virtually, and we know that our prayers um, it goes through through the lines, through the air, through the waters, and we're all connected in that way. So once again, T Guizzi Jr. Thank you. Um, I will start with a quick background on HR fifty four forty four and. Senate Bill 2907, the Truth and Healing Commission on Indian Boarding School Policies in the U.S. Act. This bill was introduced one year ago on September 30th, 2021. The House's Subcommittee for Indigenous Peoples held the hearing on H.R. 5444 on May 12th, 
with the Honorable Chair Teresa Ledger Fernandez presiding. Uh, Chair Fernandez was so respectful to the three boarding school survivors, Dr. Ramona Klein, NAB's Vice President <clears throat> Jim LaBelle Sr., and Matthew Warbonnet, who testified and told their story to Congress for the first time, along with Tribal Leader Chief Ben Barnes and myself. We will hear from Dr. Ramona Klein and Chief Barnes later in our event. The House of Representatives staff let us know they received the most letters of support from individuals on this bill, individuals such as yourself. Thank you for sending in these letters of support. It truly makes a difference. The House's Natural Resources Committee held a markup on the bill in June, and this bill is now ready to be brought forward to the floor to be passed. The Senate Committee on Indian Affairs held an oversight hearing, legislative hearing on Senate Bill 2907, the companion bill on June 24th. NAB's President Sandy Whitehawk testified during the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs hearing in June. Currently, we need to bring this bill to the House floor to vote on the passage. We have 70 co-sponsors in the House and 25 co-sponsors in the Senate. This is why NABS is asking you to join us in seven weeks of action for seven generations. We have an amazing agenda set for you all and are so thankful to have you join us. Our incredible NABS team created the idea to have seven weeks of action for seven generations to uplift HR 5444 and Senate Bill 2907 to create a truth and healing commission. The seven weeks of action is asking each of you to participate and call specific congressional members each week, each day. We have been told that once an office received 10 calls in one day on a bill, it's noticed by the supervisors. If we are able to flood one office with 100 calls each day for seven days, we will see progress. I have the honor of introducing NAB's president, Sandy Whitehawk. President Whitehawk is a citizen of the Sichango Lakota adoptee from Rosebud Reservation in South Dakota. President Whitehawk has served on the NAB's board for six years. President Whitehawk has been a lifelong advocate for bringing together adoptees, fostered individuals, and their families, as well as professionals with the goals to prevent removal of indigenous children. President Whitehawk has been in multiple documentaries, is a contributing author, and has received numerous awards, including the 50 Most Influential and Cool People Award, wow, from Madison Magazine. Most recently, President Whitehawk testified before the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs in June on Senate Bill 2907. President Whitehawk, thank you for joining us and for your most gracious and beautiful and humble leadership. The floor is yours. Good day, my beautiful, beautiful relatives. It's so good to be here with you today. I am excited. For those of you, Sichangu um, Lakota, uh, it just means it from the Rosebud Reservation in South Dakota. Um, I have a, today is just, I got really excited about today because if any of you are on here and you've done um, training in Indian child welfare or anything about our history, boarding school always comes up. And you probably have had people in your uh, participants who is, want to do something. I mean, they hear this history, what is it they can do? Well, this is your time relatives. This is the time to double back and go, because um, that's what I'm going to do. I've been uh, training again on this program for about a year now. And I had so many participants ask me, what is that that we can do? This is it. We can really make an impact. I'm so excited about this. This must be why we have come together through the internet. I really appreciate what um, 
our CEOs reminded us that while we are separated physically, we are indeed connected spiritually. So today, relatives, use the power that we've been given of this internet, of email, of Facebook, and we as Indians should easily be able to impact with 100 calls a day. That um, And hearing from your inspiration, as I was preparing for today, I went out and put my tobacco out. And I thought about those initial children who were taken and how they must have laid there at night, praying in the way that they had been taught to pray, wanting to come home, wanting to be back by their relatives, by their, the love of their family. When we ask, we're always told that we will receive what we need when we need it. I don't have any idea why it's taken this long. All I know that is the time is now. Welcome. Thank you for being here. And let's just figure out how we spread this to get 100 calls a day. We can do it. Thank you. Seed to our president, our Madam President, White Hawk, truly a beautiful leader. And I have the honor of working with her actually weekly. She's a very, um, very motivational, very uh, inspiring person. So I can see why you've received that award. Yes, we let's maintain the cool, uh, cool part. Uh, we that, like the cool part. <laughs> that was my actual first award ever. <laughs> Ah, uh, you're incredible. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. So NAMS has an amazing team. Uh, we have Dr. Sam Torres as our Deputy Chief Executive Officer, Dr. Jennifer Blevins, our Director of Operations, Stephen Curley is our Director of Digital Archives, Kenrick Escalante is our Creative Director, Deidre Whiteman <clears throat> is the Director of Research and Education, Iku Beck is our Community Engagement Coordinator, and Lacey Kennard is our Program and Operations Coordinator, and they're all joining us here today on this, um, on this webinar. Um, but at this time, uh, we will now hear from Teresa Sheldon, who is our Director of Policy and Advocacy. Teresa is a citizen of the Tulalip Tribes. She just finished up almost a three-year post at the Democratic National Committee as the Native American Political Director. Prior to this position, she worked at EMILY's List, providing training <clears throat> nationally to Native women who were, <clears throat> who, who were considered running for public office with their Run to Win program. <clears throat> the first Native American training program was offered by Teresa Sheldon. She was an elected official for the Tulalip Tribes and worked in Tulalip's Governmental Affairs Department, where we became co-workers so it's great to have this power team back together. She prides herself as a former dice dealer, snowboarder, and canoe puller. So we've also pulled out in the water together, the ocean, which is our uh, Coast Salish, uh, that's our waterways. So Teresa joined NABS as the Director of Policy and Advocacy this year. And so I'd like to turn, uh, turn our time over to Ms. Sheldon. Take it away, Teresa. Tiguid Seed, Sitsayeltsa, thank you so much for everyone joining us. Uh, what an amazing day to be together. I just have to acknowledge and say thank you to JR um, starting us off in that beautiful way and to our president, uh, Sandy Whitehawk, for just being the fierce leader you are. We have such a dynamic team who is really about justice, uh, truth, and, and telling our story. And so we know our story begins with the actual history of genocide that has occurred with our people and with our children and with our nations. And so um, there's not an easy way to get into it. So we just go straight for it. And I am so blessed to be here with all of you today to really identify and talk about the seven weeks of action. Seven weeks of action for seven generation. Our call to you, all the 500 plus who registered today um, to join us is to call in congressional members, senators each week. So if you schedule 20 minutes one day out of your week to call seven to 10 members in Congress saying, please bring forward the bill, please support the bill and please pass the bill. 
that's what we're asking. So we know um, when an office starts receiving phone calls, they start taking bills seriously. The first week of action, what we have outlined for you is to call into the house leadership. So we're asking you to call Speaker Nancy Pelosi's office and say, quote, unquote, or what is that? The um, We're asking the Speaker Pelosi, please bring forward HR 544, the Truth and Healing Commission bill on during the month of November. November is Native American Heritage Month. So please provide floor time for this Native bill to be addressed and be voted on. And so we're gonna share a social media graphic with you that outlines who to call each week. If you do not receive NABS's uh, newsletters through your email, please sign up. We'll drop the link to sign up and we'll be notified who's our um, target audience for that week. If these senators and congressional members are outside of your district, it's okay. We, told, we ask you um, to call them anyways. If your um, senator or congressperson has not signed on in your district, we ask you to call them every day until they sign on, um, because we know that this is the action needed to bring the bill forward. And so what is the bill? We're going to give you a little um, a background of what HR 544 is and S2907. And so we're going to roll into that. And hopefully we're going to give you so much information today that you will be an expert in this bill and an expert in advocating um, on the behalf of the bill. And I have to just acknowledge, uh, today is historic. Uh, Mary P Peltalola, I just messed it up, um, is our new Congresswoman in Alaska. So she is the first Alaska Native woman to represent Alaska. So 228 federal nations in Alaska, uh, kicking butt. So Tigwood Seed to all of you for giving us an phenomenal leader um, in Congress. So let's kick off our seven weeks of action. Donald no chime, nano toka Samuel Torres, ni Mexica, Iwan, ni Nawa. Greetings, relatives. My name is Samuel Torres. I'm Mexica and Nawa, and I serve as the Deputy Chief Executive Officer for the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition. The Truth and Healing Commission on Indian Boarding School Policies Act has been introduced in the Senate, S2907, and in the House, HR 5444. Senator Elizabeth Warren is co-sponsor with 24 senators, and in the House, Congresswoman Sharice Davids and Congressman Tom Cole are co-sponsors along with 70 House members. Here are the key provisions of the bill. Key provisions of the bill are to examine the location of children, document ongoing impacts from boarding schools, locating church and government records, and to hold culturally appropriate public hearings to collect testimony from survivors and descendants. The bill will gather institutional knowledge from subject matter experts and findings will be shared publicly with a final report with a list of recommendations for justice and healing to be produced. So what's inside S2907 and HR 5444, the Truth and Healing Commission on Indian Boarding School Policies Act, First, it's a full investigation into the assimilative policies of the U.S. Indian boarding schools. It examines the location of children, including locating and documenting all children still buried at or near boarding school facilities. It documents ongoing impacts from boarding schools by compiling evidence of the ongoing effects of intergenerational trauma in American Indian, Alaska Native, and Native Hawaiian communities and nations, and how assimilative policies were meant to destroy Native languages and cultures. Third, it locates church and government records by locating and analyzing all records on Indian boarding schools. Targeting records include those related to attendance, infirmary, deaths, land, and other correspondences with subpoena power for records. Secondly, S2907 and HR 5444 will collect testimony from boarding school attendees, tribes, and subject matter experts. By holding culturally appropriate public hearings, it will provide a public forum for boarding school attendees, victims, families, communities, native organizations, and tribal leaders to provide testimony on the impacts of Indian boarding schools. It will also hold institutional knowledge gathering. Testimony will be taken from those who have documents and institutional knowledge related to Indian boarding school policies, including, but not limited to, testimony from churches, 
the federal government, state and local governments, individuals, and organizations. Thirdly, the Truth and Healing Commission on Indian Boarding School Policies Act, S-2907-HR 5444, will create and distribute commission findings and recommendations. It will share findings publicly, requiring a final report on findings and recommendations to be shared with the public and the U.S. government within five years. And it will also provide recommendations, requiring those lists of recommendations for legislation and administrative actions to address the impacts of federal Indian boarding school policies, expanding upon pre-established goals, such as investing in restoration of culture and language and establishing trauma-informed resources. S-2907 and H.R. 5444 investigates beyond the Department of the Interior's Federal Indian Boarding School Initiative. It compiles all previous research and brings together partners for a comprehensive review of federal Indian boarding school policies and their impacts, expanding upon the work of the DOI initiative in order to know the magnitude of loss of human life. Please join NABS in this request. Contact your congressional member to request that they sign on and support S-2907 and H.R. 5444, the Truth and Healing Commission on Indian Boarding School Policies Act. To learn more, visit boardingschoolhealing.org slash truth commission. ACMT, Quitsi. Thank you, Dr. Samuel Torres. Um, next, we have Dr. Ramona Klein. She is an enrolled citizen of the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa, located in Belcourt, North Dakota. She has went from high school dropout to earning a doctorate of education in School of Leadership. Dr. Ramona is a retired full university professor and is currently the president of Eagle Consulting Incorporated. Ramona attended the Fort Totten Indian Boarding School in Fort Totten, North Dakota, 1954 to 1958. She testified to the House's Natural Resource Committee for HR 5444 on May 12, 2022, yielding my time to Dr. Klein. Welcome. Thank you, Deb. Bonjour. <clears throat> it's always hard. And always surprise. Thank you for this opportunity to share my ideas and thoughts about what I believe will be beneficial when HR 544 and Senate Bill 2907 pass. My name is Ramona Klein, and I am I am a survivor of the Fort Totten Bureau of Indian Affairs boarding school in Fort Totten, North Dakota. I, I attended beginning at the age of seven in 1954. I lived at the boarding school until 1958. While attending the boarding school, I experienced loneliness, hunger, emotional, sexual, spiritual abuse, and educational neglect. My father, John B. Charette, <clears throat> was all, also a boarding school survivor. And I need and I want to research the era that he attended boarding school. He died at the age of 45 while I was attending the boarding school. The boarding school experience has impacted my entire life and the lives of my descendants. It is very difficult for me to trust people to trust that they will honor my word, my physical and emotional being. I want my children and my granddaughter and all of the descendants of the survivors to have justice for the abuse by so many who attended the boarding school. For justice to be served, I believe there needs to be educational opportunities with post-secondary
Ramona, you're currently muted. Doc Dr. Klein, I think you uh, hit you hit the mute. If you can unmute mute unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? I can. We can hear you now. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Oh, we can't hear you, Dr. Ramona. I'm back? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to do something. I'm going to move this. Maybe I'm touching it without intending. I believe there needs to to be educational opportunities with post-secondary waivers so that survivors and their descendants have a better chance to live a happy, healthy, productive life. The more, the more that is invested in education, the more likely healing will take place and justice served. I believe it is important for survivors to be able to tell their stories in a safe, trusting place Survivors need support to allow them to tell their stories. As survivors, the deep emotional pain that we feel needs to be heard. No? Am I mute? Am I on? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. As survivors, the deep emotional pain that we feel needs to be heard and understood. By telling our stories, I believe it will serve as a guide for the survivors who still struggle with emotional pain and to the generations that follow us. I believe educators and medical personnel must have a background knowledge in the history of boarding school era and its, and its impact on, on students at every level from preschool to graduate school. The history needs to be told and taught by experts in the field. This is part of American history and educators and medical personnel need to know and understand it. I, rec I recommend that it become part of national standards for licensure. I believe the team serving the National American Native American Boarding School Healing Co Coalition or NABS and other agencies who are involved in collecting stories data will be the best people to write a report that includes recommendations to be published and made easily accessible to families and researchers. I was a seven-year-old child living away from my family where I, oh, sorry, where I was not protected from abuse and neglect. I did not bond with my family. My childhood was taken from me, never to be returned. I ask that no more children be taken from their families. Family life is important for all children. Give, it, give every child a chance to be loved and embraced in a healthy way. Thank you for your time, but more importantly, thank you for listening with an open mind and open heart to hear the real message and helping me to build trust. Dr. Ramona Klein, thank you so much for joining us. Um, you are why we are here. This organization is created for children such as yourself, elders, our family members, so that your truth telling can come forward. And we believe you, we love you, and we support you. So just know you're in our prayers every single day. And we have uh, beyond NABs, we have a full community of Native and, and non-Native relatives who who want to hear this story, who want to hear this truth so that we can bring justice to our boarding school survivors. So Teague Wheatley, thank you from the bottom of our hearts. 
at this time, uh, we have a, a special guest, uh, Lieutenant Governor Peggy Flanagan, who is a citizen of White Earth Band Ojibwe and is Minnesota's 50th Lieutenant Governor. At the center of all her work is advocating and making progress for children, working families, communities of colors, excuse me, communities of color and indigenous communities and Minnesotans who have historically been underserved and underrepresented. A St. Louis Park native, Peggy is proud to be a graduate of St. Louis Park Public Schools. In 2002, she earned her bachelor's degree in American Indian Studies and Child Psychology from the University of Minnesota. She served on the Minneapolis Board of Education from 2005 to 2009. I remember this, I remember when she ran. We were out helping to get her elected. Um, she went on to work at Wellstone Action, the organization founded to carry on the work of the late Senator Paul Wellstone for nearly a decade. As one of the original trainers of Wellstone Action's signature program, Camp Wellstone, she trained thousands of progressive activists community organizers, elected officials, and candidates, including Governor Waltz. NABS is honored to have Lieutenant Governor Flanagan with us today. Thank you, dear sister, for joining us. We have lots of love for you. Uh, Miigwech, thank you so much, uh, Deb, and um, to NABS, and uh, thank you very much um, to Dr. Klein uh, for telling your story for your courage and uh, we appreciate you so very much. I'm humbled to be in this virtual space with you. So uh, since Deb Parker gave you my long bio, I'm not gonna tell you anything else about myself uh, since <laughs> you heard it all. But I am really, I am really here um, because I am a mother and I am a mother of a nine-year-old uh, little girl, Siobhan, um, my little Anishinaabe Kwe, and I'm really, that is what brings me uh, to this space. I'm here today to join this call to action and to show my continued support and solidarity with the National Native American Boarding Schools Healing Coalition and all of the incredible leaders um, on this call. It's time to pass the Truth and Healing Commission of Indian Boarding Schools Policy Act. It is long overdue because our relatives have waited long enough. The ask of the Federal Commission to locate and analyze the records from 367 plus known Indian boarding schools that operated in the US is long overdue. Three months have gone by since the bill was reviewed by both the House and Senate. And that is why the time is now to continue to bring attention to this bill. There are elders and experts in this work who have showed us what it means to tell the truth. We must not back down to telling the whole truth about what has happened in our country, what has happened to our people. This act helps us to do just that. When I think about when I think about the impact of boarding schools on our relatives that for my family is one generation removed, my heart breaks. When we tell the stories to our little ones of what happened, we know just the pain and many of our young ones will never be able to come home to those arms of their relatives and their parents who love them. And this is not ancient history. This is recent as Dr. Klein so eloquently shared with all of us. Yet too many people do not know this painful chapter in our history, which to be clear is not an accident. Erasure is painful. It is also dangerous to the well-being and to the existence of our people and communities. With visibility comes truth. With visibility comes power and healing. And that's what we're fighting for here today. That's why I'm so grateful for the work of the leaders on this call and across the country who stand up every day in solidarity to fight the good fight, to educate those about indigenous history and culture and to refuse to be invisible. 
to let people know that we are contemporary people, we are still here. We have long roads ahead of us for healing and recovery, and there is tremendous trauma that is within our living memory. And that's why it's time for Congress to join us. We must take steps to nurture the opportunities for healing so that Native people can feel safe and valued and protected in their communities now and into the future. This is how we honor our little ones who never came back home and how we all have a, we all have a role to serve in this work. If there's one thing that you all take away from my time with you here today, let it be my ask to please call your members of Congress. The Truth and Healing Commission on Indian Boarding Schools Policies Act is a critical step towards healing for individuals, for families, and for tribal communities. It is up to all of us to lead the way and to continue to urge members of our community across the country to call on the House to pass HR 5444. This is today's and next week's action until it gets done. But it's also that every day you wake up Indigenous, you are fighting a good fight. Our existence is fighting a good fight and know that it is not always easy to do. But I have your back and I know that you have mine. So join us as we work together to bring truth to the front and center to honor our relatives through this act. Shimi Gwesh for your relentless efforts each and every day that you do this work. I know that it is hard and I know that work of healing and reconciliation is the difficult work but please take care of yourselves and take care of your spirits because this is about a movement and we must sustain ourselves. So Chimi Gwech for making those calls and continuing to push for this long overdue action to honor our relatives, to honor the people who came before us and those young people who will come after us into the future. And I am so grateful uh, to just be in community with all of you, even if it is virtually. And I want to now pass it on to uh, Shanoa Scipio, uh, who is uh, on here, who is uh, our president. Gichimigwech, Gigawabaman, thank you. Um, hello everyone, it's so wonderful to be here. Um, my name is Shinoa Scipio. Um, I'm Navajo in Santa Clara Pueblo from Nashchiri, New Mexico. Um, and I'm coming to you today as the National Unity Council uh, female co-president. Um, and I guess in my experience as sort of this, um, in this elected position, you know, you kind of want to do the best work that you can do for the people like that you represent, but then it's kind of hard when, um, the people who you do represent kind of don't tell you what they want to see or what they want to hear. Um, and I think this just kind of goes back to, um, you know, always being told that we're less than or we're the others or we don't belong in these spaces, um, which is completely false. Um, and it's kind of taken me a while to understand um, that piece of it um, and knowing that my voice can have a difference. Um, and so that's exactly why I chose to um, give my last year of service um, to Unity in this position um, to kind of be that voice for um, my younger brothers and sisters who you know, are still learning and they're still on their journey to understand these, um, these hard topics and to, um, really kind of understand what their role is as far as um, um, like the larger like native community. Um, and so I believe just to echo what um, Lieutenant Governor Flanagan was saying, um, but like the calls and the texts and the letters, they do matter. Um, and, you know, even if you don't have um, 
are not eligible, I guess, to really like vote the people into power, you do have a say in kind of the issues that they do talk about and the issues that they do bring up. Um, and so if we kind of think about our modern day, like Congress men and women um, as traditional leaders, you know, um, then in that sense, you know, we kind of chose them to be in the position that they are and their decision should be informed by us. Um, and so again, just to reiterate, um, it's just um, the constant pushing and the constant talking about these issues that are gonna get um, bills passed and signed into law. Um, and so with that, I would like to thank you all for having me today in your space. Um, and just letting me share a few words. Um, so yeah, thank you. Chi Miigwech to Lieutenant Governor Peggy Flanagan and to Chinoa Scipio, who is co-president of Unity. I love uh, the messages in the chat, which, which says, uh, keep being a young leader, Chinoa. Thank you for sharing and speaking today. And I know there's so many rooting you on and I know uh, Lieutenant Governor Peggy Flanagan is a huge supporter of our youth. So uh, let's keep our voices rocking. Let's let's speak our truth. And there's always a path forward when you when you share that light and that love and you have your ancestors backing you 110%. So Tiguitzi, thank you both for joining us. Uh, next, I have the honor of introducing Representative Sharice Davids. Um, Sharice was raised by a single mother who served in the Army for 20 years. After graduating from Leavenworth High School, she worked her way through Johnson County Community College and the University of Missouri, Kansas City before earning a law degree from Cornell Law School. As a first generation college student who worked the entire time she was in college, Rep. Davids understands the importance of quality public schools and affordable higher education. It is that foundation that allowed her to go on to a successful career, focus on economic and community development, which included time as a White House fellow under President Barack Obama. When she was sworn into the 116th Congress, Rep. Davids became one of the first two Native American women to serve in Congress. Rep. Davis has centered her work in office on putting Kansans first, fighting to limit the influence of special interests and make health care more affordable and accessible to everyone. Thank you, Congresswoman Davis, for joining NAB's seven week of action for seven generations to lift up HR 5444. We appreciate you and your leadership in the House. Well, thanks. Um, thank you. Uh, Deb, I appreciate the the introduction, and um, I'm so glad to be with all of you today. I uh, I'm recognizing a lot of names and and then faces on the screen here, but um, for for folks I haven't had a chance to meet yet, uh, I'm Sharice Davids. I represent the third congressional district in Congress, and. Um, yeah, I just, I appreciate NABs um, for, I thank you guys for inviting me to your virtual event, kicking off the seven weeks of action for seven generations. Uh, I am a, a, a proud Ho-Chunk uh, from Wisconsin. My mom is Crystal Harridge and my grandparents are Ruth Stacy and Lawrence Little George, who um, were both survivors of Indian boarding schools. And, you know, I think um, like I can't, I, I can't overstate how honored I am to be um, to be able to serve in the way that I do and to be one of the first two Native women uh, ever elected to Congress alongside um, now Secretary uh, Deb Holland, who I think you all heard from earlier uh, today. And, um, you know, I, I wouldn't I I feel like I would be missing a great opportunity if I didn't mention that we are about to have a historic moment um, in just a few hours. We're going to be swearing in the first Alaskan Native woman um, to to Congress. I'm very very excited for um, to to be able to serve alongside 
um, soon to be Congresswoman uh, Mary Peltola. So um, yeah, I'm looking, I'm, and I'm looking forward to the work that we're going to get to do together. Um, you know, and I, I, I will just echo the sentiments of gratitude uh, that we've already heard. Um, you know, I, I know I, I joined a little bit late, but uh, I know that's the, the, stories that folks have been sharing today have been so powerful. And, um, you know, I did get to hear Dr. Klein and, um, and, uh, just the, the strength and courage, um, and, and, and even the compassion we hear from other folks, um, in the, in, in these, um, conversations are truly the product of the strength and courage and compassion of our ancestors. And the conversations that we're having today and that we're seeing taking place um, are uh, a demonstration of just how resilient we are, of how diverse our native communities are, um, that we are still here and that we will be for the next seven generations and beyond. And I think now more than ever, we're seeing the importance of having uh, leaders at all levels of government recognize and uh, and showing up to truly address the the needs and issues of of native communities because you know we're fighting every single day uh, to make a difference in the lives of um, uh, of our communities and then as an elected I'm uh, fighting every day to try to make a difference in the lives of the folks that um, that I get the chance to represent, and that includes Native communities. Um, and we know that that Native um, Native folks are far too often overlooked by our federal government, uh, which is why a big part of my role here in in Congress in the U.S. House has been to to educate my colleagues about the federal government's responsibility. The federal government's relationship to tribes, uh, the the federal re trust responsibility that exists, and um, that education also includes the hard histories uh, between the federal government and our our tribal communities, and you know that is a that's a difficult thing um, for folks to face, and I'm sure many, if not every single person on here today is impacted um, or, or no survivors of the legacy of the, of the Indian boarding school policies here in the United States. And I think it would be difficult to find a native person who has not had um, some kind of, uh, of intergenerational trauma or impact to their families or communities, uh, myself included. And I think you know, if you just you if you just look at the the numbers, you know, and the estimates out there that you know by 1926, like 83% of Native children were enrolled enrolled in uh, at least one of the 367 currently known Indian boarding schools across uh, 30 states, and that's thousands of thousands of our children of our future leaders. Who were torn or co coerced from their families and communities by the federal government or or religious in entities um, it, to be assimilated into American society and and students at at these boarding schools were were forced to change in an entire sense of being with different names and uh, hair and language and culture and um, and during so many of these things we saw that. We know that um, that that our community's youth were not allowed to see their families. They weren't allowed to speak their language, or um, and also weren't protected from abuse, verbal or or other kinds of abuse. And um, and there's too many stories of, of of children who were never returned home. And so you know, thinking about future artists and healers and language keepers and storytellers and um, and how many of those things skipped generations. And we feel that impact um, as communities still. And the federal government and our country um, has to do better to acknowledge this legacy and, and to truly understand the full truth of these policies. And, 
you all like with the help and support and and work that you all are doing, that's happening. That's starting to happen. We're seeing um, that, uh, you know, that chapter of, of this country's history being addressed. And, um, you know, in, in this Congress, I worked with uh, my colleague, Senator Elizabeth Warren, with the Congressional Native American Caucus co-chair, Tom Cole, to, to build on the progress that's been going on. You know, uh, I reintroduced the Truth and Healing Commission on Indian Boarding School Policies in the United States Act, um, the HR 5444. And, you know, it's it we've already heard a bit about it, but you know, the this this bill is really aimed at um at you know seeking out healing for the stolen native children and communities that were impacted. And, you know, I mean getting to reintroduce something that was originally introduced by um, my friend and sister and now secretary, Deb Holland, um, you know, making sure that we're doing stuff like establishing the formal commission to investigate, to document, to acknowledge these past injustices by the federal government's Indian boarding school policies is so important. You know, we need to identify and make sure that, that we know who the lost, who our lost relatives where, where are they? Uh, allow tribes and communities to, to truly heal. And this commission um, definitely is going to include the testimony and, and that investigation um, uh, of, of all the schools, federal and, and other, the other entities as well. You know, making sure that any of those attempts to terminate Native culture, religions, languages, assim the assimilation practices, the human rights violations, whether that was the federal government or some other entity, we have, in order for us to heal and to, and to do the healing work in, across this country that needs to happen, um, we, we need this. And the commission is gonna be able to develop out the actionable recommendations that as Congress, that we can do to aid in that healing. Um, to aid in the healing of the historical and, and intergenerational trauma that's been passed down um, in Native families and Native communities. And, and making sure there's a place, a forum for, for, uh, for victims to be able to speak out about those personal experiences, um, to talk about the human rights um, violations that happened, and making sure that that we can do that with each other and help each other and support each other in that um, is it's so important and why I think the work you all are doing is is just like so amazing um, and I'm I'm working in the house to try to make sure that we're getting this we've got 72 co-sponsors now um, and we're we're uh, seeing in the house and the senate like hearings have been held which I hope. Um, shows that my colleagues are ready to listen. They have um, been listening to powerful testimony. Um, and um, and now they're going to hear from so many people across the country um, about the importance of fully understanding the impacts of Indian boarding schools. And um, this transcends political lines. This is not about political parties or political lines. Um, this is about making sure that we are getting to to, to healing. And um, it's going to be a difficult process. You can tell already it's, it's hard for folks to talk about these things that have happened. Um, but I also believe that uh, our ability to do that is why our community is so resilient. And um, so I would just like humbly request um, that everybody who's on here contact your members of Congress in the House, contact your senators and, and just urge them to support HR 5444 and also S 2907. So if you're calling your senators, tell them to support 2907. And if you're calling your uh, representatives in the House, it's 5444. And after you do that, uh, tell your cousins and aunties and everybody else to, to to make those phone calls. Well, ask your aunties if they'll make the calls, but tell your cousins to do it. Um, cause we, cause we definitely, it is so helpful when, when you all are doing that. Um, and I just will 
keep working on it from my end, encouraging my colleagues to um, to support this bill. But thank you all so much for inv inviting me to, to join you. Um, thank you to our uh, to all of our leaders, um, young and experienced, <laughs> and our elders. Hey, CM, thank you, Representative, cousin, sister, spirit sister, <laughs> Representative Davids. <laughs> We appreciate your leadership. You have a tremendous amount of support from, from Indian country and beyond. So we send you our blessings and thank you for working so hard, you and your team, you and your staff um, to help us pass HR 5444. Uh, we're, we're standing beside you. So uh, keep up the good work and we'll have your back. I'm telling Rainy to come say hi. Yes, where is Rainy? Hello. <laughs> there she is. There's Rainy. Rainy has been helping us for the past couple of years, trying to get this bill uh, on the floor and uh, for co-sponsors. And so we thank you, Rainy, for your work. And please uh, let the staff know we appreciate every every detail, every um, inspiration. And so we're, we're going to pass this across the finish line. We are going to make this law. So thank you. Thank Absolutely. you guys for all the work you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. All right. This is exciting. What a tremendous uh, lineup we have here. Uh, next, we have a, a good friend, uh, also known as uncle, uh, father, brother, chairman, Reno, Franklin, Keone Franklin. Uh, Reno is a citizen of the Kashia Band of Pomo Indians. His family comes from the Kashai villages of, now you have to, I know he'll correct me, but Dushakal and Aka Sine Kawa Li. Oh, close. He was raised in a traditional Kashia family and taught his culture, language, and traditions from his elder family members and other respected Kashia Pomo tribal members. He is both native and Hawaiian uh, Makawi Ohana. He was elected tribal chairman in 2013 and served as chairman until 2018. In 2022, he was re-elected to the position of tribal chairman. Chairman Franklin has lived a majority of his life in service, service to his people. He started his career as a firefighter stationed in Northern California in the beautiful town of Cedarville. His path of service led him back to his own tribe. And in, 20, in 2002, he returned home to work as environmental technician and tribal historic preservation officer. I promised him fry bread and huckleberry jam if he joined us today. So he's taken the offer and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Chairman Franklin. Thank you. Quick sound check. Thumbs up if you can hear me. Gotcha. Uh, so you all heard her. There is fry bread and... Uh, and huckleberries in my future, so I'm a happy Indian. Um, I'm the Reno Keone Franklin, uh, tribal chairman, Kashaya Pomo tribe, and uh, and a proud uh, uh, Hawaiian, uh, my mom's side, Pearl Ann Ku Ulani Makaivi. Uh, and so uh, our family is from uh, Maui and the Big Island and Molokai. So thanks, everybody. Um, you know, I just I'm going to read you something, so bear with me because I've got glasses, but I can see great up close, but from far away. And this is, it, It's just like this issue is so important, not just to me, not just to all of you, but our kids, our kids are watching, our kids are thinking, are that next generation that's coming up behind us. So I'm going to read you that when I asked my 16-year-old daughters, I have a twin daughters, Kayla and Kylie, who I love very much, uh, and who think their dad is the greatest human being to ever live. And, and Kayla's response to me, my daughter Kayla responded back to me. I said, what, what do you think of boarding schools? You know, these are conversations that we all have to have with our kids because they're being bombarded with sorrow and things to make you angry in, in relations, relationship to what boarding schools are. Kayla says to me, the effects of residential schools had on our communities is astonishing. Many individuals lost their sense of identity, culture, and languages. These issues are still being shown today with grandparents and parents 
knowing very little about their culture due to never being taught it or the PTSD from the past, where if they would simply speak their language, they would be beaten. <clears throat> how do we as parents, how do you as tribal leaders, how do you, as Shanoa and her, her amazing talk earlier, how do you communicate with each other and communicate with our youth on what boarding schools are and what they're not? And how do we instill the power into them to remind them that, yes, you do not forget the horrible acts of genocide that were done to you and your people, but do not let those things define who you are today. I think that the generation before us and, uh, oh man, I was trying not to cry during, during her talk earlier, you know, and, uh, and the generation before us gave us our power back. And uh, my challenge to you is to find ways to, to continue to do that, to till our cup runneth over, find ways to talk to your kids, find ways to talk to your nieces, your nephews, your grandkids, find constructive ways to give them that power and let them know that these things, this act of genocide no longer holds power over who you are as a Kashaya person, who you are as a native Hawaiian person, as a Lakota person, as a Dene person, insert tribe here, right? How do you interact with, with your youth? How do you empower them? And, I, and my message to all of you, that of all the messages I could have picked, right, as a tribal chairman, I could sit here and be like, vote for me next year, but no. <laughs> no, I want to really honor those who, who put the work in before us. I really want to honor those who are doing it now, Representative Davids. Oh, my God, you are so amazing. A lieutenant governor on here. Oh, man, I don't even know who ours is in California. Pfft, I wish. Come to Cali when you're done, please. You know, and, and if we think about everybody's auntie, Deb Holland, <laughs> who without what she does and her investing time, energy and attention into NABs and uh, pushing the envelope, I think we need to, to remember, we got to prepare for our youth for the battle ahead and, uh, and then really pay attention and thank those who are in the battle today. Um, while we look back to those who fought the battles before us and clearly won. And clearly won. And, uh, and so, you know, um, I think that, Deb, I want to thank you and, uh, and your crew for the amazing work you all are doing. Um, no makeup running. Amazing. That mascara worked because <laughs> these are tough conversations to have, right? But, uh, but we have them together. And, uh, and this is our support group. Yes. And, uh, you know, and, and yeah, I'm, I'm blessed to be, you know, Makaivi Ohana. I'm blessed to be Kashaya Pomo. I'm blessed to be, you know, uh, uh, Big Cove Burnt Church Micmac uh, in, in New Brunswick, Canada, where my grandmother was born and raised on her reserve. Uh, uh, and all, but in all these things, in all three of those cultures, there's that boarding school thing that exists. And, uh, and man, what an honor to, to be a part of the fight. What an honor to be a part of the solution. Um, and, uh, and, and thank you. So uh, with that, I really want to just state this again. Please call HR 544. You know, please call. Please call and encourage uh, time and a vote on the floor. Please call for SB 2907. Um, you know, and, and I know we're saying to, 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 call the, uh, to call your congressional members, you know, the House and the Senate. But don't forget to remind our president that you support that as well. And, uh, and don't forget to pray for your leaders, pray for your leaders and everybody that's on this call. And with that, you know, I know there's other people that got to talk and yeah, we for this time and, uh, Hey, silent language people. That's pretty good, man. I was waiting to see if you could translate Kashaya, but yeah. <laughs> Mahalo. <laughs> Aww. Teakweet seed, brother, cousin, fry bread eater, uh, uncle. Uh, what is it, Dad Extraordinaire, <laughs> Chairman Reno Franklin? We appreciate your leadership. Thank you so much for joining us today and for sharing your message. Um, I'm cooking fry bread in the back there, so if it's steamy, if it gets hot, he he likes his fry bread crispy. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you so much. Um, next, we have um, 
oh, this is an amazing young person, uh, Kutovan Ku Stevens. He's a citizen of your ancient Paiute tribe. And I'm so excited to introduce him uh, because this is a, my son, Wituwa Dewey is um, Paiute as well from Walker River Paiute. So uh, when we went to the uh, Remembrance Run this past summer, we, we followed the runners. We got lost. It's okay. We found our way back and we made it to the cemetery near Stewart Indian School. Um, but just being next to Ku, who's an 18 year old cross country runner who held a, this, this, he held a 50 mile remembrance run. I walk a block and <laughs> I'm breathing heavy. So I, he, Ku, you inspire so many of us uh, with your message and you know, this, this journey that he set up, this remembrance run was set up to honor his great grandfather, Frank Togo uh, Quinn, uh, who escaped from the Stewart boarding school as a child uh, close to a hundred years ago. And Ku ran to remember his great grandfather and all those who suffered at the hands of the government. And um, you, you truly, Ku, you, you really inspired me. You brought so much medicine to, to the people at Stewart Indian School and, and to the relatives and to me personally, to my, my son, Witoa. And uh, we thank you, we love you, and we're so grateful you're here to join us on our, our webinar to share a, a message with us. And we know that he's just started a school, so maybe you can uh, let us know where you're at, and uh, we wish you all the best. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me, uh, Deb. So I met Deb uh, at the Remembrance Run. She came up to me and um, she introduced herself, and then she also, uh, at the same time invited me to speak here and um, I was I was really happy I was thrilled because you know my event um, it, it it changes a lot of people's perspective just by going to it you could feel the, the kind of realization that people have just by kind of seeing the evidence that is presented right in front of them and um, so being able to be a part of you know a committee that is uh, that specializes in what I'm trying to do and the message I'm trying to bring, um, it's really special. So I just wanted to thank, the, uh, thank Deb. Um, so right now uh, I'm in Eugene, uh, Eugene, Oregon. Uh, I'm at Uni University of Oregon and I'm on the cross country and track team. So I'm in my dorm right now, which is Kalapuya uh, Alihi, which is the, the local, local native tribe around here. So it's cool that I got into this dorm because, you know, it's kind of native. And um, I would just like to say hello to everybody who tuned in. Um, you know, these kind of things that, that, you know, take time like this and that take effort to, you know, to change and to advocate for, they take people that have, you know, just good hearts and that want to make a difference and want to make a change. And um, so just by being here and listening to, you know, not just me, but all the other speakers here who are just amazing people, um, you know, it means a lot, you know, it shows that you care, it shows that you have, you know, what it takes to be the change that you want to see. And um, yeah, so a little bit about my story. Um, I thought I'd share my story. Uh, yeah, so my great grandfather, Frank, he ran away from a boarding school uh, not once, not twice, but three separate times. Um, each trip was 50 miles and, uh, or over 50 miles. And um, yeah, so we held a run this summer after we heard about the 215 bodies in Coulombs, Canada. Uh, I mean, we saw it on the news and whole family, you know, we're just heartbroken. We called up our relatives and, um, you know, they just the same you know, because that could have easily been any one of our relatives, you know, it's just, uh, it wasn't a wake up call, because we were already aware of, you know, how bad it was. But to the general public, it was kind of a shock, you know, it was kind of a shock to the system, because, you know, we hear different things on the news about how awful the world is. But then, you know, you hear 215 kids buried in Canada. And I don't know, it, it raises questions, it makes people want to understand, you know, why we allowed this to happen. And um, 
So once we heard about that, we kind of just made the decision that, you know, we should do something about it. And um, so me and my family, we were originally just going to have me do the run. Uh, it was just going to be, you know, kind of like put it out there, like, you know, we, we're, I'm running for this reason. And, you know, uh, and then we started, we started inviting people and more and more people wanted to join. And then you know, sponsors kind of built up. And by the time we were finished our first year, we had, you know, a little over a hundred people uh, that did the, did the trip and that were at the end and at the beginning. And then this, just this last year, um, cause it was the second annual remembrance run, we had, I think over 300 people show up, which was amazing. And we had different, uh, we had a few senators, few representatives of local tribes, and uh, we had Billy Mills. If you're not familiar with Billy Mills, I mean, I'm sure everybody is, but um, he's a great guy. He was the one who actually funded my event. So a little shout out to Running Strong there. And um, yeah, these conversations are, it, they're not easy to talk about because uh, you know it very clearly affects all of us, anybody in this call. Uh, like was mentioned earlier, um, you know, has some correlation or some connection to a boarding school. And, you know, to admit that and to kind of, you know, come to peace with that fact, it's not easy because, man, going through a boarding school, you know, just hearing the stories of the relatives and the, the lady that talked earlier, um, man, they're hard. You know, you have to choke back a tear or two and you know, to have other people listen to those stories and to, you know, really listen and to, to understand what is being told to them and how awful, you know, what it was that we had to go through. Um, that's the kind of change that is, is more needed, you know, to make this, this more mainstream is when we really start to see a change. And so by having all these people come together and doing the, the hundred calls a day, or even more than that, um, you know, really putting it in front of the senator's face or in front of representatives, you know, putting on his desk. Um, that's the kind of change that we need, you know, because we could talk about it all we want. But, um, you know, I'm a really big supporter of NABs because um, you, it's not just the, the thought, but it's also the action that's being followed up. And um, I, I really enjoy being a part of this. And, you know, coming here and speaking was uh, it was a really big honor. So. Yeah, thank you again, Deb, for having me. It was uh, glad I, I got I got to share my story. So. Cool. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for your leadership. It's hard to believe you're 18 years old, and uh, we just see the beautiful places that you're going to, and we we know that you'll you'll be an incredible ambassador for this work. And by sharing your your father's story through your your runs and just uh, we'll, we'll be watching you. We also have a Wilson Pipestem who's a runner, and I know he's he's on this uh, on this Zoom today. And so we hope to connect you with uh, somebody who's been working on the bill for a long time through Wilson through Pipestem Law. And so um, we'll connect you with him, and we know that your uh, you know your career will move forward in such a good way because you you have beautiful teachings that surround you. So. Thank you for helping share this story and to bring light to all the, the, the many victims of the boarding schools. And um, we know we have a good path ahead of us. So thanks again for joining us. Have a great first year or two at college. We're, we'll be rooting for you. Ah, oh, wow. Just this has been an inspirational gathering so far. So thank you all for for sticking with us. We have some more great speakers ahead. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce uh, Stacy A. Bolin. She is a citizen of the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians and the chief executive officer of the National Indian Health Board. With the support of a strong tribally elected board of directors, Ms. Bolin's service to the National Indian Health Board has contributed to the organization's successful work to establish and elevate the tribal presence for improving healthcare in the nation's capital, promoted and strengthened the organization's service to all feder federally recognized tribes, significantly increased NIHB's budget, staff, and connectivity to the tribes, and increased NIHB's effectiveness. 
Prior to joining NIHB, she was the Director of Federal Relations for the American Indian Higher Education Consortium, Deputy Director of the American Osteopathic Association's Washington, D.C. office, and served on the staff of former U.S. Congressman Bob Traxler. I know she's done a heck of a lot more, but we, could, we would be here for an hour just talking about how incredible our cousin, sister, relative, amazing, fearless leader, Stacey Bullen is. Thank you, Stacey, for joining us uh, this afternoon to help inspire us uh, to, to, to movement, to action, and we appreciate your long-term leadership in Washington, D.C. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Chimmy Gwich, my sister, and uh, thank you to you and Teresa and uh, I have to give a shout out to Reno Franklin, former chairman of the board for the National Indian Health Board, chairman of the board when we got the permanent reauthorization of the Indian Health Care Improvement Act. If we can do that, we can do this, right? We can do this. Um, I want to share some thoughts with you today. I put into the, um, into the chat the uh, link to the National Indian Health Board's resolution on uh, the boarding schools issue and the tribal national unified support for these two pieces of legislation that we're talking about today. Um, I wanted to share some thoughts about the boarding school issue. Um, I come at it from a little different perspective. I think that I do because the sorrow and the um, egregious grieving that is required to talk about it emotionally is too much for me. I I have to find a way to, um, to talk about what we can do because that's just, you know, where I reside. I'm a citizen of the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians. Very nice attempt at ASL there. Very impressed, thank you. Um, but my native uh, indigenous name is Turtle Woman and my responsibility to my community is to speak the truth for all the people. And so I want to talk about this in a way that um, sort of is my truth around it. Um, Crimes Against Humanity International Law. Crimes Against Humanity first appeared in a treaty in 1945 Nuremberg Charter at the end of the Second World War. Crimes Against Humanity, um, that rule of law was used to litigate the Holocaust and to litigate on an individual basis, those who perpetrated one of the greatest crimes, the organized extinguishment of uh, Jewish people, homosexuals, Catholics, and others, gypsies um, in Nazi Germany. I have had on my heart since those children's remains were found in Canada, that these are our crimes against humanities that our people have endured. And I feel that in my heart of hearts, I feel that because from the doctrine of discovery in 1493 forward, we've been subjected and our ancestors have been suggest, subjected to such atrocities and such attempts to wipe us out that we've sort of normalized suffering in a way. It's part of the blood that's in us and the blood of our ancestors that we know was shed for our survival. Um, what happened to our people in the boarding school um, policy and structure was a crime against humanity. And when we think about the health of American Indian and Alaska Native people, it has been proven by researcher after researcher that for our people, mind, body, spirit, our culture is absolutely necessary to our health. That when we endure um, basically 600 years of cortisol dumping, of course, we're going to have the kind of health outcomes that we have. Um, I often talk about a researcher in Canada who I'm a huge fan of, Michael Chandler, who looked at suicide rates among First Nations people in Canada. When I heard him speak about this, I'll never forget what he said. He said, when you're looking at suicide rates among indigenous people, the first two things you throw out are poverty and depression because they're as common as the sand. 
Why? I don't believe that's who creator made us to be, that those two things are as common as the sand for our people. Um, and I believe what he showed was that where there is strength of culture, where culture is vibrant, where languages are alive and well, our people don't commit suicide. There's a, almost no incidence or prevalence of it. On August 31st, the CDC came out with uh, uh, life expectation, how long uh, you could, life expectancy. For the first time in 22 years, life expectancy has gone down in America. But it's gone down more for our people than any other people, 6.6 .6 years less for our people in 2021 than the year before. That's the same rate as the life expectancy in 1944 for all Americans. So how do we get set back 75 years? And I will tell you, it is obvious to all of us, the boarding schools were an absolutely necessary component to that health failure for our people. It's not just about funding issues and this and that. It's about the attempt at complete erasure and how that marginalizes who we are and, and our identities as a, as a 100 year policy, 100 years of funding and, and organization for the objective of erasure of American Indian Alaska Native identity and our Native Hawaiian brothers and sisters as well. So if we know that our strength and our health rely on language, culture, ceremony, tradition, the very things that were systematically taken from our children, then we know that maybe we need a hundred year policy of a reverse boarding school. Maybe we need a hundred year policy in the United States that will be funded at 20, 23, 24, and, and 324 funding levels to reinstill and revitalize and reestablish culture, language, spirituality, um, all of the way, native ways of knowing. And the first step to getting there is getting these bills passed. So I am telling you as a delivery uh, from our board of directors, we are right there with you. We will fight every step of the way and we can do this. We fight to win. We will win. Miigwech. Woo. Let's, let, let's give her a all the numbers. <laughs> She will call every office. Wow. Um, that's the power we need. That's the voice. Man, I, you know, I'm I'm feeling inspired. I know this is this is our work at NABS, but wow, these the speakers from um just from all backgrounds, all walks of life. Uh, that's what this is about, is all of us getting together, all of us uh bringing our voice to Washington, DC to make sure that we pass these bills. So uh, thank you so much, uh, dear sister Stacy Bullen. Thank you for your leadership. Um, this has been an exciting morning. Yes, lots of love to you and lots of appreciation. So um, thank you NIHB for supporting our bill. And we know that we'll we'll reach out and get all of those phone calls. And, and that's what we're looking to do today. The um, the National um, Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition. We need your partnership. We need your friendship. We need your activation. So um, we are, thank you all for, for hanging with us. We have, uh, let's see, two, two more speakers after uh, the next person and we have a video. So hang with us. And um, this, is, this is exciting and we're revving up to, to make sure that our voices are heard. Um, so the next person we have here is uh, our dear sister, cousin, fashionista, um, just amazing person, Sedelta Oswahi. Uh, Sedelta is a citizen of the three affiliated tribes and currently is a senior program policy analyst specialist with the National Education Association, where she manages the American Indian Alaska Native portfolio, managing national partnerships and advising on policy. Previously, she served the Obama administration as senior advisor and acting deputy director for the Office of Tribal Relations in the U.S. Department of Agriculture. 
Before that, she was the associate director of the White House Initiative, American Indian and Alaska Native Education. Prior to shifting her career focus to the national level, Ms. Sawahi served the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma as Special Projects Officer and as Coordinator for Student Programs in the Center for Tribal Studies at Northeastern State University in Tahlequah, Oklahoma. So Delta, thank you for joining NAB's seven weeks of seven of action for seven generations. Let me do that again. NAB's seven weeks of action for seven generations to highlight HR 5444 and Senate Bill 2907. Thanks for joining us, sister. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, so I'm joining you today as a a descendant of a boarding school survivor and as an educator. My mom attended boarding school from the age of five to 12th grade, kindergarten to 12th grade. Um, so I grew up knowing about boarding schools. And um, I remember as a child hearing her tell stories and I thought this is so crazy. I couldn't imagine or fathom being five or six years old and having to leave home. She would leave home in the fall and she wouldn't return until the spring. She was gone that entire time. Um, as an adult, I moved away from home and I struggled that entire time and I missed home, I missed family. So it made me definitely think more about that experience my mother had as a young person having to do that. Um, it wasn't until I was well into adulthood that I realized and thought about how that had to impact her life as a mother, as a parent, as a person, her development. And it took me again well into adulthood until I realized that it also impacted me. I didn't think that boarding schools impacted me because I didn't attend them directly, but it took me several years to realize that it did. Um, part of HR and part of these bills is designed to look at the lasting impacts of boarding schools. And I think it's something that we all need to know and understand since many of us are descendants of boarding schools. I think it's so important for us to know what that looks like and to have a place and resources for us to know and study this. Um, when I was on the East Coast, I had the opportunity to visit Carlisle Indian School. Growing up, again, knowing about boarding schools, I assume that Carlisle existed because of the boarding school. When I got there, I was shocked to realize that that was just a small part of the history of Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And I was even more disheartened to realize that it had been erased almost completely at the time when I visited. This was about 10 years ago. I can't speak to it today. Um, I had the opportunity to visit the um, campus and my friends and I had gone to the gate for security and we asked them, are there any things that are left from the boarding school? And the guy responded, oh, there's a cemetery and there's a gym named after Jim Thorpe. So you can go check those out if you want to. Um, so we walked the campus and we were surprised to see that the boarding school and all the buildings were still there. They had placards to talk about and discuss what the buildings had been during the boarding school era. And I was just struck at how this was such a microcosm of what happens in our school systems and in this country where our stories are erased, our history, our culture. I had grown up, like I said, thinking that the whole purpose of Carlisle was to create this boarding school and to know that it was such a small part of its history and that it was one that had been forgotten by that community was disheartening. The other takeaway I had from that was visiting the cemetery and I was struck at the size of it. It seemed very small for what I heard and what I had known about the school. And it made me wonder how many of these existed, how many of them were out there, and how many of these graves maybe were not marked or hadn't been um, somehow reconciled in that space. Again, part of what we're asking for is to find out how many students died in these places, how many people were there, how many people have been impacted by it. When the report came out in May, from the Department of Interior, I sat with my mom and I think we were both shocked and surprised at the numbers that were being read out. 408 schools over 37 states um, from 1819 to 1969, which again is not ancient history. And that's just the federal system. We need this legislation to pass so we can start looking at other institutions that had these boarding schools. It wasn't just the federal boarding schools. There are also institutions and churches who had them. My mom attended parochial and BIA boarding schools. We need to know and see the records of those other schools. Um, I had the opportunity to read records from um, an ancestor and relative who attended, attended Carlisle. And I had a visceral response to hearing letters and seeing the handwriting of my great, great, great grandfather asking for his son to return home and his sister who asked for Claire Everett to return home. And it was 
so tragic to hear their heartfelt letters and their handwriting and to see the responses from Colonel Pratt himself and the conflicting stories that he gave to both people about why he couldn't be returned home. So I think we need to see these records. We need to know what's out there and we need this legislation to help us get there. And we need your help to make that happen. The seven weeks of action is vital. Um, we always want to find ways to support and to do work and to be activists. And this is a way to do it, to make these phone calls so that we can all start learning and understanding the true scope of what happened. As my sister, as my mom said, actually, she goes, this is just the beginning. The story hasn't even begun to be told. And I think it's important that we have uh, this legislation to help us get there so we can all start learning and knowing the truth so we can begin the long process of healing. So I want to thank you guys again. And I um, just again encourage you to, to call. And if, if there's anything we can do to help you, please let me know. Thank you so much. Beautiful. Thank you, Sadelta. Thank you for inspiring us to take action and, and for your own personal story. It's, it's these truth-telling moments that help uh, elevate uh, the work that we're doing because um, without you, without your family, then you know, this, this story cannot move forward in the way that it needs to, this truth and this, this harmony that comes together when we tell our truths about what happened to us during the sporting school era. So as, as, as young people, as we listen to our elders, um, it's, it's such a reflection time for us because it also allows us to heal with them. So this togetherness is so needed and, um, your voice is so appreciated. We're glad you're at the national level and that you can help us um, work with NAB so that we can partner and tell this story so that um, this truth and justice and healing will begin. So Tigwitzi, thank you. All right, uh, next we have uh, Dallas Goldtooth, uh, who is Dakota and Dene. Uh, he is uh, the Keep It in the Ground organizer for the Indigenous Environmental Network. He is a Dakota cultural language teacher. He is a co-founder of the Indigenous Comedy Group, the 1491s. He is also a poet, traditional artist, powwow MC, comedian, fry bread judge. I mean, this, this list goes on and on. Currently, he is known for his role as spirit in Reservation Dogs and also the new cur curator Nelson at Reagan's Museum on w Rutherford Falls. That was really good. If you haven't seen Rutherford Falls as well, um, and I think they need to continue that series as well. So that's my plug for that. Um, but we're, we're very happy to, to look forward um, to Reservation Dogs series and I know our families are watching it on television and laughing and receiving that good humor, but also that healing in this process. So, um, and these two characters opposite of each other, yet both brilliant. So uh, this is the guy who's been talking smack in the chat. Um, please welcome Dallas Goldtooth. Thank you for joining us. Oh, uh -huh. wake up. There's somebody sleeping right now. Like, oh, oh. Oh, what are they saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Burn their churches. Yeah, yeah. F the government. Yeah, hell yeah. Hand up, fist up to you, Uncle. Hey, <laughs> hey, everybody. How mitaki pi chante washte nape chiu zapido yushke mi chiankapi. My name is Dallas Goldtooth. I'm Badewa Kantawan Dakota from a little community called Lower Sioux Indian Community in so-called Minnesota. Uh, I feel like. This list, of, like they put me at the end and they say, got 10 minutes, man. Like that's, that's a lot. And, and then they got all these like, like aunties and uncles, like the chiefiest of all chiefs all talking on here. And I'm supposed to like follow all that. What do you, I have to, I feel like I have to get all like super chiefy now. You know, I got to get the presenter hat on. I got to get my, 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 my freaking deer antler, some sweet grass, you know, this is crazy because I know half the Indians on here, you all got Indian stuff right in front of you, just like out of sight. I can put my moccasins on and now I can talk to the people like that that way. Uh huh. Um, <laughs> I, um, I'm very humbled and I'm very grateful to be on this call with all of you and for all those that are interested to learn more about how you can help in this effort, right? This, this, this uh, endeavor 
to do right by our people who have been through so much and their families who've gone through so much to learn more about our shared experience. And um, it's powerful. I'm taking off. I'm taking off the Indian stuff. I gotta go back. I gotta go. I'm just a humble person here, a humble, humble servant of the people. So I gotta wear the humble hat, you know. Um, and uh, those of you who may not know, I, my name. I'm an actor with the res uh, show Reservation Dogs. I'm also one of the writers. And there is a scene in one of our last episodes where it's, it was like at a conference. And one of the speakers gets up and, and is a young man. And he's like, oh, before I say anything, I'm going to share a few words. And I love that because I've heard that so many times in the Indian country. I've heard Reno Franklin say that at least 10 times in one speech <clears throat> before I say anything. If we were to say anything as a Pomo man, I'm going to share a few words with you all right now. <clears throat> so... I'm happy that we get to share these stories from Indian country on TV through Reservation Dogs, through Rutherford Falls. We have story, we as people are storytellers. That's how we pass down knowledge through the generations. And right now, here's an opportunity to learn more about our story um, and, and about who we are as a people and what we've gone through, and also to share that with the greater society of this country, right? With this move, that, with this commission and this, um, this legislation to unlock those stories, to search out our stories is essential not for only for us as a people to find a path forward and to make uh, and to heal ourselves, but also for this country to come to rights with its own history and how it contributed to the oppression of our families. I, uh, I, have, my, I have four grandmothers who are all, who all went to boarding school. And um, one specific, um, one of my, my mother's grandmother, while she was at boarding school, her parents passed away. So she became an orphan and she was raised in the system. And when she got older, she ended up uh, meeting another Dakota man and they had a child. And effectively what I've come to learn through, and I, I'm gonna say this, this is really personal here, but I am, I, I'm a proud supporter of therapy. I'm in therapy. I encourage each and every one of you to go th through therapy. I encourage my brothers and relatives our, our male identified relatives out there to go to therapy. And through that process, I come to learn how, how I was raised and some of the challenges and the, the, my experiences were a result of the fact that my grandmother was raised by somebody who didn't know how to be a mother because she was raised by a system that didn't teach love, that didn't teach what it meant to be a parent. And therefore, her child grew up in a place where she didn't feel that affection. And therefore, my mother also experienced that. And then it trickled down to where I experienced that. So even now, I'm a result of boarding school. My character, my identity is a result of what happened to my, my relatives. And many of us on this, many of you who are watching, many of you who are, are, are speaking, we are all uh, products of that in many different ways. And so it's essential for us to really um dive into what that means and how it impacts us so i appreciate all of that and i appreciate this effort and you know look i everyone's already said it like there's the there's the numbers it's always confusing right there's a house number there's a number for the house there's a number for the senate look talk to your representatives and let them get them on this right let them know that this is important that they need to step up and voice up and voice their opinion let your tribal leaders do their work and encourage them to talk to the senators and the representatives like that's how we do. That's how we build power. Um, and uh, yeah, I I I don't want to take up all ten minutes here because I'm like I'm just like just like like I said, I'm just a humble warrior here in service of the greater chiefs at this council before you. Aho! Uh -oh, there's an eagle cry in the background right now. I don't know if you hear it. Ah! You know, the chiefiest of them all, Sedelta. So thank you for your words and bringing me into the space. And I hope you got to go to the bathroom because I know you're waiting for a long time to Delta, not to bust you out like that. Um, Deb, thank you for your leadership, everybody's leadership, Teresa, um, for inviting me into the space. I, I think that the last thing I'll say is this, and it's, it's super corny. We always hear it, right? Laughter is medicine. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Like all that. We hear that, right? But our ability to talk about who we are with no shame is the most powerful medicine. The ability for us 
to own our trauma, but also to own our excellence and our beauty and power is what makes us even more powerful. It's what makes us complete human beings, and that's our goal. So I want to encourage each and every one of you to be brave and to own your story in all its complexity and all its difficultness as a people, as a family, as an individual, because it does make us stronger. It helps us guide us uh, ever forward in the right direction. And I, I just cherish every one of you who are doing this work. And the folks on this call, I'm talking to the panelists, but also I'm talking to those who are going to be watching all 205 I see in the thing there. Um, and humor is medicine. Yes, it is. And we can't be afraid to laugh and make fun of ourselves and tease ourselves as we are often, as we often do. Um, and we can't be afraid to bring that into the public space as well. Like, let's, 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 let's be lighthearted about our struggles. And sometimes it's hard to do that. And sometimes it's not appropriate, but it really is our ability to laugh, the ability to make light of the situation, I think really is what got us to this place and let, got us through the hardships and will continue to get us through those difficult times. So thank you. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Shinoa because you haven't moved one bit on your video. I've been watching you. I think that's like a, I think you're using a bot. I'm watching it. Stacy, you did a great job. I love your hair. It's always ever so like perfect. Sandy, you intimidate me all the time because you're one of those aunties that I, I get scared because I think she's judging me all the time, but she's not. But just like, that's my own insecurities. I'm owning that. I'm going to own that. All right. Um, Sam, just keep doing you. Oh, nephew. In that good way. Oh, and yeah, I, I appreciate, I love every one of you. and. That's my bit. Please, like, be a part of this movement. Seven days of action, seven generations. You know, talk to your clans and your spirits, <laughs> and, and do your bit. Put out your sage, your lay out your tobacco, whatever you need to do to help those who are going to be taking action, those who are going to be going into these meetings, those who are going to be talking to representatives and leaders. And if you're doing it, we're behind you. The people are behind you, and we will succeed to make sure that our stories are heard and that healing does come to our communities and our nations. So thank you all. Appreciate each and every one of you. Talk to you later. Peace. Hey, CM Dallas, beautiful message. You reminded me I had skipped my therapy session for the last two weeks because we've been working uh, for, for, you know, this event to pass a bill and I forgot my therapy session. So my therapist texted me yesterday, Deb, where are you at? So I'm like, ah, I'm going to get back in therapy because that's what's needed. I want to be a good mother, a good relative, and a good support uh, member of the NABS team. So thank you for reminding us. And also that humor, that's, that is a piece of our medicine. And sometimes when you're in grief, we forget to find the beauty in the laughter and all of those, those good things in life that our relatives left for us. And so just the fact that we're here as indigenous peoples, it's, it's, um, it's a, it's a beautiful reminder and to see you all, oh, look at the smudge, smudging my words <laughs> and to see you on, you know, television, you know, I know our kids and others are, are, um, they, they have a hero now, you know, so these are our new modern day heroes. And so thank you for being that. Thank you for your, your brilliance. And um, yes, we've had a, a beautiful afternoon together. And so we, we also, we steal, we steal people from organizations. So I think we, we might um, take uh, Dallas and Stacy, Sedelta, we're, 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 you know, Reno, uh, we know your chairman, but you know, we, we take people from other organizations. So uh, we, we, uh, and that kind of leads us into uh, Kenrick Escalante. We, we, uh, we stole them from NCAI. And so we're proud of that. <laughs> uh, he's working as our creative director and, you know, it's, uh, he's going to show our PSA. So he's been working behind the scenes. And so we're just excited and thank you for the team NABS and our NABS board um, who, who show that strength and leadership and support us in such a good way. And to, to each and every one of you, thank you for, for uh, sticking with us. We have our PSA and then a few announcements, and then we'll wrap up this, this afternoon together. So Kenrick, I'll turn it over to you. ACISCM. 
Hello, friends. Every Indigenous, Alaska Native, and Hawaiian has the right to truth. We have the right to know the truth about what happened in Indian boarding schools in the United States. This starts an accurate accounting of the number of our relatives who were forced as children to attend these schools. To ensure this never happens again, we need to know the truth about how many of our relatives were abused, died, or went missing. Every American Indian, Alaska Native, and Hawaiian has a right to healing. Every Native person in our country carries the trauma and the harm of Indian boarding school policies in their blood and genetic memory. To heal, we need to know the long-term impacts and implications of these institutions of racism, white supremacy, and genocide have had on our children and families, past, current, and future generations. The irreparable harm cannot be undone, but we as a country can begin to acknowledge and reconcile. That is the foundation for a future of healing that our boarding school survivors and their descendants deserve. Every Native citizen, Alaska Native, and Hawaiian has a right to dignity, restoration, and an opportunity to share their stories. A Truth and Healing Commission on Indian Boarding Schools is a necessary first step for our country to address long overdue injustices experienced by generations of our relatives. The time for healing is now. We can't wait any longer. Our relatives deserve the dignity to share their stories of the harm they've suffered, the trauma, and the resilience. Our children and families are still dealing with the generational impacts of Indian boarding schools, and we demand restorative actions that are written in a policy, as well as a direct resource that helps our tribal communities revitalize and restore our culture, language, and well-being of our children, families, and tribal nations. We are in a time of truth-telling, so let's take action together. We ask each of you to call key congressional leaders to enact the Truth and Healing Commission on Indian Boarding Schools Policy Act. Which calls for a full inquiry and accurate accounting into the assimilative policies of the U.S. Indian Boarding Schools, including a full examination of boarding school archival records and the ability to subpoena documents if not brought forward. Culturally appropriate public hearings for survivors, descendants, and subject matter experts to provide testimony and inform institutional knowledge gathering. The creation and dissemination of commission findings and recommendations shared publicly that will set the foundation for policy recommendations that work toward restoring the culture, language, and well-being of our children and families. A comprehensive investigation that goes beyond the Department of Interior's Federal Indian Boarding School Initiative and builds upon all previous research. The time is now. 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 Please call your senators and congressional members today requesting they pass H.R. 5444 and S. 2907, the Truth and Healing Commission on India Boarding Schools Policy Act. All right. Well, this this brings us closer to to our closing. Uh, we want to thank you for that beautiful PSA for all of the speakers who are coming forward to donate their time and energy to help us ensure that we pass this bill. Uh, NABs cannot do this work without each and every single one of you. We appreciate you and appreciate all of the speakers today who spoke so passionately about calling your congressional member. I would like to end our call today with a request to please join us in this seven weeks of action by beginning today. Please call your congressional member today. Uh, you can find more of this information on the boardingschoolhealing.org, and I believe someone will put that in the chat. Um, we also, um, let me see. 
Um, Teresa Sheldon is, I'm gonna turn it over to you to see if there's any other action items that we need to take before we close. Uh, Teagweed Seed, ACM, what an absolutely amazing launch to seven weeks of action for seven generations. Um, thank you for all of you um, 200 plus who have hanged in there with us for this um, really powerful message and powerful testimony that we have seen from tribal leaders to advocates um, to, to, the, to the young spirits that are guiding us today. Um, Kenrick Escalante has been amazing and fabulous in producing a toolkit. Um, we have the toolkit that outlines talking points, letters, draft letters, uh, social media, tweets, and all of that. And so that toolkit Lacey has shared in the chat, we will send all this information out. So if you're not on NABS's newsletter, please sign up and you'll receive all the links. Um, the videos will be available on YouTube, but we'll send them out as well um, in a document. Facebook, NABS, uh, National Boarding School Healing Coalition is on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, please use those, share them. And really it's gonna depend on each and every one of you for helping us do these calls to action. And so I believe that was it, unless Kenrick has one more slide to present. We're supposed to make it real fancy and everything. Uh, there we go. And so week one is right now, today. We ask you call Senator, um, call the Congress and call uh, Speaker Pelosi and call the different staff on the list. Next week, we will have a new list of people to call. So don't think oh, I'm gonna wait till next week. Nope, we need you this week, next week, and the next week and the next week, all seven weeks. We ask you, please help us um, bring this home. Teagwood Seeds, our hands go up to the leadership, um, NABS's CEO, Deborah Parker, for this fabulous event today. And thank you to all of the leaders on here. And um, Kenrick, were you going to sign off with um, a song? Yes. All right, brother, take it over. Uh, Ken Kenrick Escalante. Uh, Fierce and amazing. You got the floor. Thank you. Um, I'm getting a pop up. I'm apologies. Thank you so much. Iwahot, Kamadum Venti, Vamai Tadits, Quetzan, Im, Amolik, Kenrick Escalani, Medikan, Im, Amolik, Nyats Quetzan, Nyats Havatsats, Nyats Creative Director here at NABS. Uh, thank you and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kendrick Escalani. Uh, I am a citizen of the Quetzal Nation. Uh, I am of the Frog Clan and I am the creative director here at NABS. And I was asked to uh, close this out with a song and I just wanna say thank you all. Uh, right now, we're in the age of truth, justice and healing. And you know, during this hard work that we do, we need to know that uh, the Creator is with us at all times, and so uh, the song I'm sharing with you is from my lands of the Quetzal Nation, talking about the um, the Creator Himself always manifesting Himself when needed for your strength, for your guidance, and the way He manifests to us is through lightning, and these are lightning songs, and the song I'm going to share is showing you that we see Him, and we see Him in the lightning. Oh, Ravigna, you, oh, Oh, 
Iwafa. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Please join us in the seven weeks of action. Call your congressional leaders. We need your help today. Thank you so much. Hey, Sam. Thank you, Kenrick. And thanks each and every one of you for joining us. Thank you to the participants. Thank you to NAB staff. Thank you to our beautiful, lovely speakers. Um, we love you. We send out many blessings and please join us. Don't forget to connect with uh, NABs if you have any questions and we will continue the seven weeks here together as uh, one effort, one mind, one heart, one spirit, ACM. Thank you.